Okay, so today I'm going to be doing something a bit different. Um, I'm going to be trying covering something from the absolute beginning of Lua. So, if you've never even touched Lua or any other programming language before or since, that's okay. This is designed to get you a bit up to speed and have a bit of an idea about how the language works and how to write stuff in it, really. Um, I was going over some of the old lecture notes and, um, and, and exercises that we have for, for you know university teaching of computer science and stuff, but it's not much fun. They're just sort of fairly boring exercises. And people don't play Minecraft because I want to you know, do all math math sums and 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 you know stuffy old exercises. They want to you know make stuff in, in Minecrafty stuff. So let's let's actually do that. So what I'm going to build here is this is a this is essentially a subway station. I'll talk more about it in the second tutorial. We'll just cover mostly the the basis of the original one for now. But um, eventually this is what what we'll be building. It's a system that'll send this sort of this mail cart back and forth. Now um, I've included the the world file in. Um, the description for this this video. So if you want to download the file, actually code along with me. Um, really good way to sort of get an idea about how programming works is to actually sit down and, and, and work it out with um, you know while, while you're looking at something else. So we can do that now. Anyway, um, come to this computer here. If you've got it running, it'll have a disk in the drive there. And let's just open up that disk. So we're going to see disk here, and then just go into the sol n folder, the solutions. And this has got the answer to all the to the stuff that we'll be working on here. So um, the first thing I'll talk about is variables. I think. Now, um, there we are. Now, a variable essentially is a, a value that can be changed in a pr the duration of a program's life cycle. So it can mean lots of different things, but usually it's a value that is saved somewhere in the program hub that we can dig out at different times when we need to use it. So if, for example, there's an important number that we want to use or we want to keep like a count of something that, that things that have occurred, we can use a variable to keep track of these things. So, And this is how we make a variable. We give it a name. So I've just gone very unoriginal, gone X, Y, and Z. You could also go like, you know, hello or system or... Uh, honky tonk. I don't know. I'm stretching. You can you can still use most of whatever you want to here. You shouldn't use numbers um, or you know as as variables. That's very bad bad practice. And try to avoid using keywords like true or string or str things like that. That they're usually bad variable names to use as well because they can be a little bit ambiguous. But for the point anyway, just just something like that will be usually be fine. So, and we can give them a value. So and you can give them whatever value you really want to. So let's start with looking at numbers. You can store numbers in them. Well, that's fairly something fairly simple. If you actually just close this and just go run variable by going variable. Ah, uh, I appear to have commented this out. So just uncomment that if I haven't already. That's just remove those two lines there. Just run variable. And then it'll just print out whatever the variable those x, y, and z are, are at the time. So we've got x, y, and z being equal to 1 there. But we can give them any value we want. So we can make that 10. We can make that 1.5. We can go 1, e, 3, if you want to go for like a scientific number. And there you go. Some nice, some different values of numbers. Well, they don't have to say the same either. We can change them. So we change that. Right? It overwrites the old value with the new one. We can even add to our old values. We can go x is equal to x plus 1, for example. And now it's equal to 11. So there you go, that's pretty cool. You can use any form of arithmetic that you can think, um, arithmetic equations that you can think of for regular mathematics will work here in Lua as well. So for example, we could go x plus y. Let's give those better values, something about 5 and 5, for, um, maybe 20 actually. x plus y. So you can see 5 plus 20 is equal to 25. That's what Z's been set to. Try X minus. Try these on your own. I won't go through them. X times. That's the asterisk value there. That'll times those together, and that should get you 100. And you can even divide. So it's probably better to go there. Y divided by X, rather. And that will get you the value of 4 there as well. You can also try using the modulus function, like this one here. If you go for something like 5 and, let's go 17, for example. So... 17 divided by 5 will return 3, but it'll be something like 3.4, and that's 0 0.4 because it has a remainder of 2, and so when we run this, you'll see that the modulus actually returns the remainder of the division, so in this case it's going to be 2. So we can do that there as well. And you can, yeah, you can play around with numbers as much as you want to, and they're, and they're very easy, and they're, and they're very important things to use, so that's a good sort of to experiment and practice with those as well. The next things you can store are strings. A string essentially is just like a piece of text, like this is a piece of text. Now this won't work because um, Lua will look at this and think that this is a whole bunch of variable names or something else going on here, and it'll just break. In fact, if you try it like this, 
first line, it's, yeah, something has gone wrong. It doesn't really understand what. So don't worry about it. We can't use that. If we want to have a string, we have to enclose it in quotation marks, like this. And now it'll know that it's a string. Now we run it. Of course, now this is still no good. Let's just change this to... Like that. And there we are, look at that. So we can have lots and lots of stuff in the strings as well. We can also add strings together, a little bit like the way that you would add text together. By going X, then using the dot dot, which means the concat, which means stick to the end of the other string, this one. And look at that, and that'll produce hello world, then it'll go hello world, there you go. So, playing around with strings as well. And they're useful in lots of other applications as well, so we'll be using them quite soon as well. And the last thing I'll show you are Boolean values. Um, you can't go like a step without running into Booleans when you're working in computer science. There, It's extremely important. Um, essentially, Boolean logic is referring to binary logic or binary mathematics. And in binary logic, we have only two possible values. That's true and false. And this makes up a huge amount of logic operations in programming because computers will always operate on a binary system. They'll always operate on when something is true or false or one and zero. And you, you understand that that's sort of where that, that, that whole sort of culture comes from if you're not familiar with it already. So we can have these values being true or false. You can't print them, unfortunately, so just make sure you comment that out. This It won't allow you to print strings together. But we could just have a bit of a play around. It might be worth... We'll, we'll look at debugging a little bit later on, but there are lots of things we can do with Booleans. So we can have values being it's true or false. There are three main operations we can run on Booleans as well. So we can have, first off, AND. If you're familiar with the AND keyword, a little bit like um, AND in um, search engines or and in other languages like that. In this language, for example, we can go x and y. It means that this will return true if both x and y are true. And it will return false in all other situations. So this will be set, so for example, in this instance, z would be set to false. And now it will be set to true. If we go x or y, we can use the or function, it means if either one of those things are true, then it will return true. So for example, it would return true now. It would still return true now it will return false like that, so on and so forth. And the other one that we have, the last one, is the not keyword. So for example, not x. So in this instance, x will be returned to true. In this, z will be set to true because x is false. And if we set x to false, to true rather, then z now will be equal to false. So it's the opposite of whatever it was beforehand. So you can, of course, chain this up. So you can go, you know, not x and y, for example. So that would return true, not, so that would always return false, whereas if we were to make that to false, that would return true. And that's how we also do Boolean logic. Um, you can also do Boolean logic with other things like numbers. So if we have, for example, let's make this 10, let's make this 20, you could use, there are three, there are lots of different operations we can use. So for example, we can check to make sure the two values are equal by going equal equals like that. Not single, but double equal signs there. If x is equal to y, that'll check to see if x is equal to the same value, or x is equal to 10, for example, so that'll return false. That will return true. Then we have the not equals sign. Tilde equals means if it's not the case. And this is identical to saying and not whatever's in there, um, like that. Rather, sorry, it's more like saying not x is equal to y, for example, like that. And that's identical to saying x is not equal to y. So in this case, that will return true. Now it will return false, like that. And then finally, uh, so in addition to that, we also have x greater than y to see whether or not those two numbers are bigger. So in this case, that will return false. And now that will return true. Then that will return false if we make that less than, exactly the same thing there beforehand. If we want to make sure that they're the same, we can also use greater than and equals to and less than and equals to. And that will return true in that case as well, where that would otherwise return false. So there you go, that's Boolean mathematics. Boolean logic, and that's really good stuff to work with. So that's enough on variables. Let's move on to logic next. Let's edit logic. And this is going to make up the brunt of your application. Um, we're going to talk about conditionals and loops next, and these are very important. So we'll start off with conditionals. So essentially, you sometimes you want me a program to make decisions depending on the situation. So for example, um, if something has occurred or something is in a certain state, then I want to program that. Uh, sorry execute the following instructions end here. I'll stop like that. And this is essentially the structure of a conditional. If something is the case, then do this sort of thing here and finish once you're done. The way this looks like in the program is like this. If 
condition, then, statement, end. And that's the syntax for what we call a conditional, or an if statement. So I'll just show you how this will work, for example. So we go, if x is equal to y, then print hello, like that. There we are. And let's just see how that looks. So just run logic here. Now you can see nothing's happened because they're not equal. But if I change this to x is not equal to y, hello, there we are. So there you can see it's making a decision, right? They're depending on a certain state. If you want to make it consistent, you can just go if true. means exactly the same thing, not hard at all. But let's stick with that x equal to y thing here. And let's just say this is equal to... They are the same. And this is our program. So what if we want to print out something to say they're not the same? We could do this. And that sort of works for when it's wrong. But when it's true... You can see it's printing them both out, and that's no good. So what we can use instead of that is we can use what's called an else statement. This sort of means exactly the same thing otherwise. So if this was true, then do this. But if it wasn't true, then do this instead. That's sort of what it means, otherwise. And so let's try that now. They are the same. We've got logic here. And let's just change this one here. False. They're not the same. And there you go. And that's making a decision. So that'll probably do for conditionals for the second tier. The next thing we'll do is looping, which is very important in a programming statement. Sometimes you want to do something a lot of times, or you might want to do it forever. So how do you do that? And the way that we do this is we do this through what we call looping. And a loop will look like this. So long as something is true, do the following code. Execute these statements. Check to see if the loop is still true stop the loop. So what will happen is it'll check to see if that statement is true. It'll then execute this one here. It'll go back to the top of the loop to see if it's still the case. If it's true, it'll start again. Otherwise, it'll just stop the loop altogether. It'll just go around and around in like a loop over and over again. That's the general syntax, the general method it works. And so how this looks in code is we use the while keyword, while statement do. Followed by an end, instructions like this. While condition, I should say. While condition is true, then do the following instructions, do statements. There, and then end. That's roughly how it's going to look. So we can use exactly the same thing, just like the, the, the if loop. So if then, while do, exactly the same thing here. So we're going to go if x, while x is this, then let's print hello, like again. Now this is interesting. So let's take a look at what happens here. Set that to true. And you can see it's just printing that over and over and over again without stopping. It'll just keep checking it over and over again. That thing never comes out true. Eventually it's going to stop just because it's um, we've gone on for too long without yielding. So let's go back into our logic and see we probably want to stop this code somewhere. This produces what we call otherwise an infinite loop, which is not a very good thing to have. So if we want to stop the code at any time, we can just use the break function. And that will leave the loop immediately. So now we can go, again, logic. You can see it'll do once and then stop immediately. That's, that's, that's not too bad. But this is a bit boring. I mean, just this isn't really a real loop. So let's try something a bit different. Let's have x being equal to 1. And let's have y equal to 10. See, while x is less than y, print hello, and then x is equal to x plus 1. So think about what this is doing here. We're starting off with the value of x is 1 and y is equal to 10. So as long as x is less than that, it's going to increase x by 1 each time it runs through the loop. And it's also going to print hello. So think about what that's going to do for a second, and then give it a try and see what happens. That's right, it's going to print that out ten different times. Once for each time it's increased. And this is what we call an iterative loop. And this can also be done with a for loop, but we won't worry about those for today. That's, that's, this is roughly the idea of looping. That I reckon I will probably do for the first tutorial. That's a lot of the core components about how we do general programming. So now that you've learnt that and figured that out, Go out and practice it. Try a few different things. Try making some different stuff. Um, you can look up things like I.O. and things to, to really give yourself a bit, of, a bit of a handle about it. But for the second, that's a good start. So give that a try. See how you go. Have fun with it. And then we can come back for the second tutorial and we can start working on this train system.